you may take this as a place that is in your backyard, a place you love to support, but this is really one of the leading college and university art museums in the country. And I'm, I'm here in part to remind you of that and only brighter things ahead. So, so nice to be introduced by my respected colleague and, and cherished friend. So, uh, did you know, 12 days ago, we reopened our grand galleries of modern and contemporary art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And we also launched a new vision and a strategic plan, and I'm still trying it out on people. So our vision at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which I think has resonances for you here at Rollins, is that Sam is a place to picture yourself in American art. A place to picture yourself in American art. I think we're gonna make t-shirts out of that as well. Uh, we've coming out of a three-year period of closure and reflection, and also a, a rethink of uh, American art and again, from 1945 to today. And so I'm happy to share our insights uh, because again, I am keeping an eye on what you're doing here too, so that we can learn as well. Because for 2026, the semi-quincentennial of our country, USA 250, by July 4, we will have gone floor by floor by floor to provide a newer, more expansive uh, story of American art. Something to look forward to. Now, I uh, have been watching what you've been doing, and there is much on the horizon. Forbes magazine has noticed that you have a bold uh, vision ahead and uh, that this is an institution that one has to keep one eye on nationally. So I hope that uh, in some of my comments tonight, I can shed some light on our journey, uh, but I'm always going to ask you, what is it? Where do you see yourself in American art? Which works of art? Um, what more are you needing from this museum that you're going to imagine together into the future? And I'm coming back for the opening, uh, by the way. I don't want to miss that. And of course, you have this great uh, motto, let there be light here at the, at the college. And of course, uh, you do this with great collections. Museums are judged on the caliber of their collections. And of course, you know this news and you've already shared some of the works and, and some of the works are hanging here too. Uh, again, new collections invite you to have new um, connections between objects. And when you add something new, you have to ask yourself, what's missing? What do we need to strategically add? Again, um, uh, I think uh, Tennessee Williams says, it's the kindness of strangers that we benefit from here at museums with these transformational gifts. And yet you need to be strategic about what you're gonna add as well to make the most meaning um, out of uh, what you hold. And also to make meaning here in Florida, in this college environment. Uh, how is it that you need to see the future as well? So I wanna uh, talk a little bit, um, as Ina said, about the evolving definition. Where is American art going? And language is important. Uh, when you enter the lovely Alfond Inn and even entering this museum, there's a lovely neon piece by Joseph Kosuth that says, uh, importantly, that uh, language must speak for itself. So let's take a look at language for a moment here. How do we think about American art versus art of the United States? Uh, so this is actually hot off the presses. This uh, little note is in a catalog at a recent exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And again, language is important, how we identify ourselves, where do we draw the lines, because we also live in the Americas uh, as well as the United States. And then the second question that we're all grappling with, and both personally, you know, what is my identity? Who do we determine is an American artist? And more and more, we think about American art and global connections. We are linked uh, to so many places in the world. Many people come here or have come from here to tell the American story. So I would tell you more and more, we're interested in that last category of who is an American artist, one that has influenced American art as well too. Uh, preferably that has also uh, lived uh, in this country too. And again, to language, um, uh, wait, I'm gonna go back for one second. Uh, one of the important things about American identity relates to a colleague of ours, Arnold Lehman, the former director of the Brooklyn Museum, says the number one book that art museum directors and maybe college presidents should have next to their bedside table is the US Census Report. We are a changing country, and we need to change to prepare for all that is coming. And I know Rollins 
has a, 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 a undergraduate and graduate population that is shifting like America. Uh, from the website, some almost 60% white, some 20% Latino, 6% African American, 4% two or more races, uh, kind of a, a newer category under census categories, some 4% Asian, lesser Native uh, Hawaiian and, and Native American. And then an interesting category since this is a school that attracts so many people from around the world, 10% of the Rollins uh, college population are U.S. temporary residents, again, coming to, coming to school here, too. So that, again, adds to the bigger story and diversity of Rollins and what they expect from their art museum. And so, again, language is important. This is a work that a uh, beloved piece in our collection. Uh, it's in a traveling show by, about this artist, John Quick to see Smith. Native American, and she has made a map. And so we have to think about what's present on the map and what is absent. Has anybody figured out what the commonality is about all these states that she represents and the ones she leaves out? Having lived in some of these states, I can tell you the state names that she includes are ones that were named by the indigenous peoples, right? So it's again, how do we see ourselves? How do we see America? And again, the names left visible are those that stem from an indigenous uh, source. Now, as we think about our place, we have to think about uh, the world we live in. This museum sits in the larger Rollins College, and that brings unique resources and opportunities. I, at the, leading the Smithsonian American Art Museum and our Renwick Gallery dedicated to American craft, live within the Smithsonian. And again, did you know your national museums, the Smithsonian, dedicated to science, history, culture, and art, are the world's largest such complex. And we also have research institutes that are very important. Uh, and we always like to throw in the National Zoo, the much visited free National Zoo, although we're very sad that we're losing the pandas. But that's another story. Um, under 21 museums, and nobody has to write down if they can name all 21 museums. I struggle to do it myself. We're having fraternal twins, so within the 21, uh, you may have read Congress has authorized a National American Latino Museum and a Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. So don't rush to, uh, thank you, applause is needed for these kinds of developments. Uh, don't rush to DC right now. Give us about 10 years. Uh, there's a lot to be done in building these institutions and staffing them and creating a bold vision. But th this is the world um, that I operate in. And we have a transformative leader in Lonnie Bunch, the 14th secretary. And this is what he has reminds us is the role of the Smithsonian. The glue that helps to hold the country together. I, I think we can all uh, say we're living in divisive term times. And so libraries, museums, we are trusted places, trusted sources that people go to. And the secretary has further said that we need to increase our relevance, our reach, and our impact. We have to talk about the issues of the day. We have to reach more people and bring them into, the, um, into what we're doing. And again, we have to increase the impact of all that we are doing. Um, I was on the search for the secretary. It was a great experience, I would tell you. I was one of um, two directors who participated. And you may know Lonnie. He was the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. As he likes to say, gee, I, I built one new museum. And now that I'm secretary, I get to build two new ones. Uh, that's a lot to ask. So here is my museum for those of you who has been to the Smithsonian American Art Museum portrait. Oh, I love you already. So come again and bring others. Uh, so we uh, are situated not in a purpose-built museum. Uh, we are in the third federal building built called the Old Patent Office and uh, situated strategically between the White House and the Capitol. Why would that be so important? We are a country of innovators, of inventors. And so early on under President Jackson, he signed the patent law, which says that when you invent something new, you have to make a working model, you have to do a drawing, and you have to explain what it is, and you present it to the patent office. They check that there's nothing like that, and they give you a patent. Uh, last I checked, we were at our 10 millionth patent in this country. Again, that's much to be proud of. And so not a bad place for an art museum, because actually a lot of artists hold patents. They create new processes and things like that. So it's, it's, it's not, a, a, not a bad home. Look at the early date. 
that we began the construction. So this was the early days of this was before we had electricity. So it was important to have um, uh, inner courtyard and, and other things. So this is our grand building. We share it with the portrait gallery. And so it's um, uh, two city blocks long. And um, so bring your most comfortable walking shoes. I also lead the Renwick Gallery, which is located by the White House. This is a purpose-built museum. Uh, it was William Wilson Corcoran who outgrew the building and then moved down the street to the Corcoran Gallery, which sadly no longer exists as a, as a museum, and vacated the building. Uh, and then thanks to Jackie Kennedy, who saved it from destruction, from being turned into a parking lot, Lyndon Johnson gave the building to the Smithsonian. And, and literally about 50 years ago, uh, it became the Renwick Gallery dedicated to American craft. And I had the pleasure of going to your Morse Museum here. And I was there with envy because since the story starts 50 years ago, our strengths are from the American studio craft movement. You know, think about uh, D.L. Chihuly and, and, and think about um, uh, George Nakashima and, and other great artists of, uh, of, of the 20th century. And unusually, it's named for the architect. I, I, I asked this question. I don't get a lot of answers. Name another building named for an architect. It's named after uh, Renwick. Uh, and James Renwick Jr., in this case, his first building was the Smithsonian Castle. So quite a different style from this kind of French uh, uh, Second Empire style and was called the American Louvre in its day. Anyway, I'm just trying to situate you and also give you some examples for, for buildings and such. Uh, <laughs> So one of the important things we do, uh, and this is when we're often in contact with, with uh, Rollins, is we have the National Collections of American Art, and it is our mission to share them across the country. Um, you haven't asked yet, but we also lend works of art uh, for an extended period of time uh, to museums across the country. Uh, and we also uh, populate the White House, the Supreme Court, US Capitol with uh, our collections of American art. And so the times we've been in touch with Rollins is, is uh, recently in, in 2019. Did, who saw this exhibition? OK, not enough of you, but uh, you missed a good one. There's still a catalog. Uh, this, again, is one of our strong suits. We have the most important collection of African-American art um, in the country. And then a little longer, uh, ways ago, 1998, one of our core collections, uh, this uh, Sarah Roby uh, collection that was here. And um, this is one of our three Edward Hoppers. And I can tell you, when our Hoppers are out of the building, I hear about it um, <laughs> as well. And together with both buildings, we are the fourth most visited art museum in the country. Uh, and again, a critical aspect of our work is to share the national collections. So I think we need to shift into this present moment. Uh, we're living during a really historic, exciting time. Sometimes it seems a little unfun to see what's happening on the news in your nation's capital. However, artists are confronting history, are commenting on history. And this is a lovely uh, neon flashing piece. And again, where does neon sit? Is it on the craft side? Is it on the fine art side? It doesn't matter. These definitions are less relevant. Um, but we're living in this unimaginable future, which is now, which is, which is this present moment. And so we need to update the story of American art for this present moment, right? The last reinstallation we did was in 2006. And so we're going to be finished in 2026. That's 20 years ago. I think the world feels different. Um, it certainly feels different post-pandemic and, and uh, even trying to remember uh, pre-pandemic. And so one of the things we did as we started this journey, and I'm sure you are thinking about this too, is to go to other museums. How are other museums representing American art? So notably, the MoMA, and some of you have made, been there since 2019, has uh, made some big efforts and rethought their collections. Not only did they expand, uh, but they really made a commitment to exhibit significantly more art in new and what I would say notably are interdisciplinary ways. I think museums are less paintings go over here, sculptures go over here, photography goes over here. No, I think we're mixing more because artists worked in more than one medium. And these artists were living all at the same time. So sometimes we have boundaries for perfectly good reasons. Photography needs less light than a painting and such. So this is, again, something that MoMA is doing. They invited the artist Amy Silman and said, what is it that you love at, in the museum? And let's put it all in one room. And let's look at the collections through your eyes, through your perspective. 
then we went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art too. And again, I took all the curators, I took some of my donors, and they have done a beautiful job with their American art galleries more recently in 2021 and have done these beautiful things with their collection. So uh, in Philadelphia, they've really thought about telling the story of Philadelphia in the days it was the cultural capital um, uh, of our country. And so focusing on these great Philadelphia artists and look what fun they've had. Um, can anybody guess, is that a real step or not a real step? It actually is a real step, which the museum filled in where the painting ends. And so again, what do you see and what do you, and yet look what they have paired it with. They've paired it with a very important portrait overlooked of an African-American to, to, to invite in more people to see themselves represented at the, at the museum. So much that we liked and some things we didn't like at, uh, at these institutions. I also happened to, uh, for my resume, uh, was in the Pacific Northwest, but I came back in 2022 to see how the Seattle Art Museum thought about their collections thought about what stories they should tell uniquely. So first of all, no American art museum, not even mine, has the definitive comprehensive collection. We're, we're pretty, pretty strong, but we always have some areas where there's just, we don't have the holdings, we can't tell the story. So the thing that the Seattle Art Museum did notably, and again, it's the first time in 15 years that they've rethought their collections, is they invited the artist, Wendy Redstar, to make a new picture of the community. And these are, uh, people from the Leshai uh, uh, nation here, set against the mountain and set against the skyline of Seattle. That is the first work of art you see when you enter. In other words, picture yourself here too. Picture yourself against the skyline. Picture yourself among these people, some that you may uh, encounter in a, uh, in a daily way, but some that you may overlook. So again, they have decided also thematically to tell the story of how people interact with land and place we think about the Pacific Northwest as a place of beautiful land, and that is important. They've reflecting again on the land and trade and migration and exploration. Again, a lot of resource extraction there, whether it's salmon or timber there. And then they're also interrogating the multiplicity of identities in, in America and telling this local to national story of America. So again, a lot to learn from. Again, didn't love everything. Don't ask me what I didn't love. But there was a lot that was provocative in terms of seeing the collections um, in a new way. So here we are. Uh, we've titled our project American Voices and Visions. That's our initiative. And again, we invited many voices in to reimagine the collections. Uh, this is one of our favorite artworks. It's an artwork I often stand in front of and I say, where are you from? And if you talk to people where they're from, I'm sure you can pick more than one state, right? Where you've lived or worked or studied. This is the great Namjoon Paik, um, uh, electronic superhighway, United States, Alaska and Hawaii. I'm sorry, Alaska and Hawaii are kind of where I'm standing in, in this corner. And here he's taken, again, one of the leading figures of, 20, of the 20th century, both as an artist and a thinker. There's a wonderful PBS documentary, if you can catch it, probably in reruns. And here he is taking 336 TVs. I know that's a question, so I always lead with 336 televisions, make this up. And he has looked to see what are the defining characteristics of each state. Now, I'm gonna say he got a little lazy with Idaho. Look at those potatoes. Um, Washington State, he was good friends with the dancer Merce Cunningham, who hails from Washington State. And I looked up today what Florida has. I'm afraid it's beaches and sunshine, but that's not such a terrible thing. Interestingly, DC, the nation's capital, has a camera that looks at you. And suddenly you are part of this big American nation. Now, whether you call it surveillance <laughs> or whether you're included in all of this. Again, this is one of the marquee works and is really important in thinking about the stories that we wanted to tell. Because again, in the modern period in American art, it's just an explosive time of creativity. Again, look at these materials quite unusual in terms of uh, what we might expect in a museum. And as you think about your reinstallation, uh, think about uh, I, the ABCs, right? You have to think about the art. You have to think about the building. Uh, and again, I'm envious, purpose-built building is always best. Uh, think about the content and the context. What are those Florida stories and what are those collections 
that are transformative, that you go in to the Rollins Museum and you know where you are and you know why it's important and you know why people love this place and care about it. And how does it sit in a college environment? Again, a unique, uh, important twist. Uh, think about uh, installing things with humility, whose voices need to be included in ways you have not done. And know that it's about big ideas, especially if you can't tell a linear story, what are the big ideas that are uh, a part of our um, time in America? So as I said, we just opened the other day and we began the process with a white piece of paper. And I'm gonna be quiet for a moment so you can read what guided our thinking. You're all fast readers, I know you're there. Um, interestingly, we find that people love modern and contemporary art, although I would tell you they don't always know why or may not always understand everything about it, but it is the art of our time. We have a better chance of understanding it because we're living through these days. We have the opportunity to meet artists. You bring artists here, I'm sure. And also, I think we have are wide open about definitions. Is that art? What material? Do you have to be a trained artist, or could you be an uncredentialed, self-taught artist? Again, different ways of, of opening up the conversation and, and revising definitions. So again, this is our, our building, a different view with this great courtyard. And this is at the very top of the building, um, our modern contemporary galleries. And I just want to share with you the history of the building just ever so briefly. Again, this is when it was the patent um, uh, uh, office, and again, 100,000 people a year in the 19th century walked through this building to be inspired, to come up with a, with a better invention. And luckily, we still have some of these great patent models still in the building, too. Uh, there was a, uh, we moved formally into this building as the uh, American Art Museum with a slightly different name in 1968. And these are these grand spaces, again, uh, divided up and, and beginning to tell the story of American art. Uh, also, uh, we had to rethink objects. Some of our collection had been outside. Uh, this custom uh, work by Calder for our 1968 opening relating to water lilies, um, this beautiful piece that uh, rewards you everywhere you walk around it was originally outdoors, and now we have brought it um, indoors. Uh, and it lives just as well, I'm happy to report. And so these were the galleries when we reopened them in 2006. And again, light and airy, lots of windows. But look up, there's a lot of junk up there on the ceiling. Um, it was actually problematic to have artworks in the middle of the hallway in terms of touching and you know, moving carts around and things like that. Look at this little square around the Dwayne Hansen uh, figure. You think that stopped people from touching? Prayed not, prayed not. So here is what we have done today. So we actually closed more windows. So we doubled our hanging space, not one square inch of new space. We took the walls up higher, again, uh, giving you a lift into the space, and we freed the columns. The columns are there anywhere you, you look, but let's make them an alley, let's make a vista, and then important to have uh, great anchor artworks. You see the Calder, how perfect that looks. And it's got a little company of other sculptures there too. So another thing we thought as we were building this is what do we not have good space for? Uh, art is changing all the time and we're living in the great age. Uh, some 20 years ago was the first time YouTube was launched and now there are billions and billions of people watching videos. And just as I shared with you Nam June Paik, we've made a dedicated gallery, a black box of sorts for video work. We call it time-based media. This is an artwork that unravels, unspools over time. And so we interestingly made a black box, but we also made a gray space. Turns out a lot of these video artists have taken photographs, have works on papers and drawings, and so you can have a bit of a conversation. And that's certainly true for the Carrie Mae Weems piece. Oh, I forgot to tell you when we were looking at that historic image, when the, muse when the patent office was built, it was one of the largest convening spaces in Washington, DC. So that's where Abraham Lincoln held his second inaugural ball, inviting 4,000 people, having a great celebration. They kind of ran out of food, but that's another story. Um, and he would be assassinated a month later. And so the, uh, we call these galleries the Lincoln Galleries. Uh, and so this piece by Carrie Mae Weems reflecting on Lincoln 
and Lonnie and me was felt so perfect, right? The perfect piece for the perfect space for the, for the history of the building. Uh, and she came out to speak to us and she's just a remarkable artist. And we're now considering that gallery a separate exhibition space. We can decide what's an exhibition. It doesn't always have to be big. It can be small, but it's a dedicated um, space for uh, artists working today. We also had to find these key anchor pieces, works that could be read on multiple levels. Um, uh, I love a good American flag artwork as much as the next person. And here's Hank Willis Thomas, an artist working today. And, and when you see it, you're gonna see the gray side, the side here on your left. Uh, it is based on a Dorothea Lange photograph from 1942, taken in San Francisco before Japanese internment. And if you take your camera, your, we actually invite you to take your flash on, and then this picture emerges to the right. You see the diversity of America, these kids. A very powerful and evocative work, and an interactive work, which um, audiences um, certainly love. And of course, uh, when you do new space, you, you call everybody home. This was a work that belonged to one of my, my advisory board members. She said she was gonna pledge it to the museum and I said, now's the time, I need it now. So here's your chance to go and take things off of people's walls. You heard it here, they're coming um, <laughs> for your artwork. So, uh, so keep buying um, boldly. I wanna show you something that we've done too, which is um, added artist voices. I discover new things every day, every time I go to a museum, and that's what the works are there for. <laughs> Can I tell a story? Can I make it a good story? Can I pull you from the other side of the room? Those are all things that I try to do with my artwork. I'm more interested in presenting um, the stories and the experiences and the histories that people, real people, have experienced, uh, but we haven't heard. I'm a beneficiary of, of learning from so many different people, but also making sure that I amplify those stories back out in the community. I continue to love the relationship between the aesthetics and the politics and, and, and the way in which Art, the art that I make makes me think and also enjoy the beauty of the image that makes me think. I was trying as much as possible to keep the process I used uh, as close to the industrial process as possible because I, I felt it was a, a blue collar process. I, I didn't want to go for that you know, that art process. The materials that I use and have really always used have always been paper. So just in my head, I thought, oh, well, you just have to wet it so that it can move like paint. Part of the job of the artist is to pay attention to what's, what, what's being said to you, what's being told to you, right? Um, and then using, using all of that, um, so that you can actually get out of the way of the work and do the work that the work needs. The most powerful works are the works that do not dictate what they're about. Art speaks of who we are at our very best. And you go into a museum and you can see that over and over again, that divine spark, that humanness, that heart. You can't live without art, and it is healing and on all levels. Um, the process of it, making it, looking at it, art is it. It's really important for me as an artist to have a, a representation of myself so that, you know, youth could see themselves and these particular environments like museums. Hopefully I will give some inspiration to some young people or, you know, uh, evolving artists to know their community, to preserve their community, 
and not allow someone else to do it for me. When I hear from some young person that they saw a, a picture of mine and that it had an impact on them, you know, I feel like, well, I guess it's, it's, <laughs> it's a good day. <laughs> and it's all been worthwhile, you know. It, that really has made it worthwhile. Again, this was a chance where we could have the artists talk about their process and what they think about too. Now that's a little bit more difficult with historic works, but I think you can still bring in the voices, the voices of people of the time and bring the issues uh, to life in exciting ways. Again, bring back the relevance to these historic objects and from time to time, maybe invite a contemporary artist to be in conversation, to be in dialogue with the works that frankly have inspired them and the artists that they studied and think are important as well too. So that was just a, a little bit of a, a, a little soup song, a little taste of, um, of what we've done in the galleries. Uh, I actually don't have so much photography since we, <laughs> since we just opened up, but I, I grabbed a few images. You might want to know what's happening next, and let me give you a bit of a preview uh, and, and how we're thinking about things. So again, make your reservations July 4, 2026 in the nation's capital. So we, we have this dramatic space called the Loose Center on the third floor, and it's open storage. Think about that too. Uh, you are a teaching institution here, bringing works out constantly that is expensive and time consuming. How much can you put up in different ways? We also have a conservation lab where we care for our own collections as well as do uh, important national research. And one of the ways we're activating the space is adding very dramatic uh, large scale sculpture by um, an artist from Los Angeles, Glenn Kino, who was obsessed as a young man by the US sprinter, Tommy Smith, who you may remember in the Mexico City Olympics of 1968 did the Black Power salute. And so he befriended Tommy Smith. He did a mold of his hand and then reproduced it hanging as if it is a snake or a fossil or something. It, it's an act repeated. It is a kind of our history of being seen and being visible. And this hangs over your head and of course, since you can go upstairs to see patent models and the collections, you can see it from different angles. So this will be an animating feature for the space. We're also gonna invite more community conversations. How do these works of art make you feel? How are your stories represented in, in, the, uh, in the museum? Again, we see museums today ever more as safe places for difficult conversations. There's no right way to look at art. Art sparks a conversation, sparks an experience, sparks an idea, particularly modern and contemporary art, which is uh, again about that provocation and um, sparking dialogue. This is something we're done, doing on the second floor, which harkens a little back, bit back to MoMA, different media. Again, this is the earliest moment in photography, daguerreotypes and American painting. This is an unbelievable story. First time it's been shown in a museum in Cincinnati, an African-American uh, daguerreotypist, so he had a photo studio, J.P. Ball, was working, as was Robert S. Duncanson, an African-American painter, and they worked together. We believe that Duncanson colorized some of the photographs. And this is, again, an untold story, an important um, uh, um, moment to share. And notice how much more text we have. We want to give people context and an environment maybe a little less text around the actual object because we want you to, to build those connections. So again, um, the other thing you can't see, maybe hinting a little bit on the right, is we have definitions. Again, in early photography, what was a tintype again? And what's the daguerreotype? And what's the process? Again, help people out. Why do you want to look at your phone if we can provide the information for you? So again, a new story. And this is actually a, a, a very transformative moment in American art. You go from... Um, uh, painted portraits of beloved ones, these tokens of affection, to photographs of loved ones. And of course, certainly with the Civil War, photography was very important because you didn't know you're going to see your loved one again. So this is this pivot point from painting to photography. And we just brought in these unbelievable collections. And we have the most important African-American, uh, early American photography collection by like a multiple, we just bought two large collections. Um, so sort of 30 examples each of, of these major figures. Another thing we're trying to do, and again, might be something you wanna consider is which artists do you have in depth? Where can Rollins tell a story that no other museum can? We're deep in Alma Thomas, a DC based artist. We have over three dozen of her artworks 
and she is an artist that is more and more important as an inspiration for others. She was the first um, uh, student at Howard to get a degree in fine arts. She was the first African-American woman to have a solo show at the Whitney. And here she is inspired by uh, the eclipse. And this painting uh, with an ancillary photograph hung in the White House under the Obama administration too. So again, we're telling a DC story, DC places and DC talent. And um, there was just something on CBS Sunday morning the other night um, in case you missed it. And this is three galleries, not a big show, but, but seeing an artist in depth. Also, we're constantly buying work and getting gifts. Uh, you, every time you wanna celebrate these incredible, uh, generous, um, additions to the collection. In Washington, D.C., we say these are gifts to the nation, and we're building the most important collection of Grandma Moses. We'll have about three dozen Grandma Moses works, and it's a show we're planning for 2026. Did you know Grandma Moses was born in the Abraham Lincoln administration and died in the administration of John F. Kennedy? What, what an arc in terms of her lifespan, and what does her work tell us about that time, and what does it still mean for us today? We're also buying contemporary work. Uh, 2023, how about that for a fresh piece? Um, also, is this a painting? It has, it has uh, paper on it. The paper uh, comes out. So we're already thinking about the next rotations coming up. And we're buying things together with other institutions. Uh, wouldn't it be great to share the cost of something to do an exhibition in case our sister museum is the National Portrait Gallery? Uh, and then again, technology, let's not forget, we're living the digital age. What are new resources? So we've signed up with Smartify, which is a, uh, you know, based on your own um, smartphone, you download it on an app. Oh, you can download it tonight, actually, if you just put your smartphone up, the QR code comes up and you see that we offer information in English and Spanish and American Sign Language has the capacity to, go, to be translated into 129 languages. It has videos, it has audio clips, and then better yet, what you loved, send home to yourself. You know, keep your own little file. And then we're gonna learn more uh, about you too. And if you like the Alma Thomas works, hey, did you know we have an Alma Thomas catalog? We might even be able to sell you something. Um, so this is something that is, again, brand, brand spanking new. We're doing family tours, we're doing collection guides, building tours and new voices. So um, artist voices and, and other uh, um, notable individuals. And part of this, all this work, and it may be a moment for you to revisit your mission statement. What are museums about today? What do museums need to be about today to be responsive, to be relevant, extend their reach and um, their impact? So again, we wanna inspire that individual reflection dialogue among others, and then build connection. People are feeling lonely, are feeling disconnected, and don't we wanna come together as well? Uh, then, you know, thankfully only four goals, so I have some hope of remembering them. Uh, and uh, again, we wanna be leaders in the field. We wanna have an engaging experience. We don't want to just have this don't touch, be quiet, museum expectation. Uh, art, works of art invite you to interact in exciting ways. Uh, also, our institution has a lot to offer. And again, we wanna raise our visibility as well. And it's also how we do the work together. They're just changing expectations about the office environment, including telework and whatnot. So I leave you with also a, a moment of inspiration. We at the Smithsonian American Art Museum are working with the Ringling College of Art and Design. They have these super talented students who can just draw and create in fascinating ways. And so we got a grant and we said, you know what? The stories of American women artists are not well told. Why don't you do some graphic novels for us? Pick an artist, pick a style, and tell the stories of these artists. And they're online for free, although some days I would like to sell these. Uh, online for free, and we're in our third iteration of working with, with these students on it. And the students are learning to be on time and deliver materials and to um, get revisions and such. So this, again, you can find um, on our website. And that's just a reminder that you have these incredible resources here at the college. And so that is gonna make you uh, shine above other museums with, with, with you know, comparable uh, histories and collections, because you can bring the college into the museum as you can bring the museum into the college environment. So there is much 
um, to be excited about on your journey ahead as you reimagine your collections. And now we're at questions. So I always like to say, what questions do you have? Not do you have questions? I know you have questions. Uh, what did you maybe find surprising in what I shared? I'm ashamed to say I didn't know the new museum was a patent office. Oh, well, yes. Uh, uh, we haven't done a good job of telling the story of our building, the old patent office. People are interested in architecture. They are interested in how these buildings came about, especially in Washington, D.C. We have a building with columns that looks a lot like other federal buildings. So am I in the Treasury Department or <laughs> agriculture? No, you're in the old patent office as well, too. I was surprised simply to learn the existence of an art museum within the Smithsonian, which I didn't know existed. Thank you, because if you know the history of the Smithsonian, it was founded by James Smithson, an Englishman, a chemist, never came to America during his lifetime. He's here now. We moved his bones. He's in the <laughs> Smithsonian castle in the, in the crypt. Um, and he left money for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men, but we've dropped that among men part. Increase in diffusion of knowledge. It sounds like old language. George Washington used that language in his second inaugural address. And so we are also a research institute, which um, you know, alluded to, we, we educate the next generation of scholars in American art. So research is important, but yeah, art museums, uh, but we're the first federal art collection. We actually predate the Smithsonian. We sort of got folded into the Smithsonian. question about when you talk about what's missing or what voices aren't being heard and how do you how do you determine what that is especially if perhaps um, the voices that are being heard are people that may feel, may not may not come to the museum may not feel that the museum is for them like it's almost like this almost a vicious circle so how do you break that yes well uh, sometimes our buildings are austere or imposing sometimes there's an admissions uh, price. We were just talking earlier with the, the terrific staff you here have here. Thirty dollars is what it's going to cost to go to MoMA in New York. Um, uh, so we have barriers which already say maybe don't come. So the most important thing actually is if you come as a child, if you're comfortable coming. And so I usually end my talk with bring a child to the museum. Museums are intergenerational spaces. Where where can you go? Do you really want to go to the mall? buy new sneakers, well, that might be fun. But is there a place you can tell stories about your family and your values and things that inspire you that can spark curiosity and build connections? Uh, and so it is really important to make people feel comfortable. And again, sorry, I don't work for Rollins, but I would tell you one of the things that's unique here is that if you have a great college or university art museum, there's hope that these students will find art is important in their lives. It is an introduction to new possibilities, new resources. And so I'm expecting a few trustees in the future to be Rollins College uh, graduates because they've had this important formative experience. So you got you to get them in early um, or find something. Uh, that's why we also have to be on social media, right? If there's something happening, then we have to kind of make some reference to the collections and, and see if we can be. Yep. Yep. But, you know, we're all excited about Beyonce's world tour. At least some of us are. <laughs> Beyonce's an art collector, right? So I'm waiting for her to talk more about art collections, too. Neither of my parents are really into art, but my grandmother is. And so she's, in fact, when she comes for Parents Weekend, bringing her art books that she has, and I'm going to bring her here. And so that's why I'm considering minoring in art history, because she actually started that with me. And then she also started talking a lot about Greek mythology with me. So I'm actually a classics major. So start young. That's yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How about? Uh... I'd like to give a testimonial. I have to admit, I haven't always been clear on which part of the building was portrait and which was film. Uh, but before COVID was the last time I was up with my granddaughter who was at IDC. And maybe the best time of my life with her was the um, suffrage. Uh, and you had several galleries. Yes. The building had several galleries on suffrage and experience and women and things that drew children. And she was probably 11 at that point and happily 
I studied in that school and a, and a lovely little cafe. Yes. 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 We try to keep people in the building. So I couldn't break them for a long time. Wow. So did that spark conversation? To oh, oh absolutely. So like, I mean, of course. Right. Again, think about if you wanted to learn American history. And as maybe if you know English wasn't a, a strong suit for you, do you go to the American History Muse National Museum of American History, which I love, which has the Star Spangled Banner and Julia um, Child's Kitchen and all kinds of great stuff? But there's a lot of reading required. But if you look, you say, hmm, I think there's something about American landscapes that's special. I think there's something that we celebrate beauty and place, and it, it gives us a unique identity because in America. We celebrate landscapes because we don't have the castles and cathedrals of Europe, and that we have to um, think about those natural wonders. Uh, uh, Niagara Falls, uh, why is it a honeymoon site? Or was, maybe. Uh, it was so often painted. It was, it was how we understood our country. Many people were never going to get across the country to see this great wonder. So we have a little artistic license in some cases, but it was a, a way of saying, this is this American country. And artists also had agenda in these times. I mean, again, I don't want to get, get, be talking about your collection, but uh, artists uh, like Thomas Moran in a great painting of uh, the, the uh, canyons of Yellowstone in my building influenced Congress to create that unique American institution called the National Park System. When it was hotly debated whether we go to resource extraction, no, we need, we need the trees, we need all these things to fuel this country. No, we need to save these places for ourselves, for future generations. So again, artists have agendas, and artists are very much uh, involved in the contemporary topics of today. And because you go to art museums, I know that you're curious people, that, that you want to learn and see. And maybe you don't love everything, but I'm sure there are plenty of things that you do love, that you come back to, and that you're going to bring a friend to and say, hey, while we're here. And to be a free museum means you can come for five minutes. Versus having to think, oh, do I have enough time? You know, how much does it cost? You know, all these things. So again, a lot of advantages. How does Sam define American art in terms of history and geography? There's pre-Columbian art, Gabriel Garcia, and Sam Williams. How does that sort of relate to your definition? Yeah, thank you. It uh, actually, we're really struggling with that with tribal nations because. Uh, Borders are made uh, external to who lives there, right? You wake up one morning, you're on the other side of the border. Particularly in Canada, you know, there are artists like Kent Monkman, who's from the Cree Nation, that sort of straddles the border. So we're going to call Kent Monkman an American. We're going to um, look to add him to the collection. Historically, we have not had those collections. Those are collections of what we consider indigenous peoples, and that's at the um, National Museum of American Indian. However, as you will see when you come back, how do you start the story of American art? Do we start it with uh, colonial times? Or should we start it a little earlier, start it with the land, start it with Native American art? That's the conversation we're having um, about how we, we present the collections. And so that's going to require us to move a little out of our comfort zone and buy artworks where we don't have the expertise, but we'll have shared expertise from our sister museums. Like you had Norm Pike's uh, map, and you had Jean-Luc Deceives. Uh, you know, neither one were a white European. Uh, they're, they're, they're part of the, the soup of this country and the brilliance of this country, I think. Those are two magnificent works. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we have other maps, too. There's a lovely Tiffany Chung map of the world. And with threads, she tells you where, after the Vietnam War, people were scattered. Where did they end up? And although that is a story maybe unique to you know, the Vietnamese American story, it's not dissimilar to, the, to any peoples who had to migrate. Uh, Jewish uh, post-World War II uh, migration. Uh, uh, this is the time of the most number of refugees ever in the world. People are being displaced from home with a high likelihood that they will not return. And so how do you make new homes? Uh, how, do you, how do you connect in an international way? So again, artists invite these kinds of questions and conversations uh, in a powerful way. I'm, I'm still thinking, you heard a little of Carrie Mae Weems. We, we had her as our speaker um, 12 days ago, and she talked about uh, the number of American leaders who were assassinated in the 60s. And she named four, right? John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. She said, imagine if 
if one of them had survived? How different would our history be if two had survived, if all four of them had lived today? And yet you can ask the uh, ancillary question, which is because they were killed, who had to step into leadership? Who had to, how did this change the nation, right? I mean, again, these kind of provocative questions um, about our American identity in the, in the course of our country. So I remain ever hopeful about the direction of this country because I'm so enamored by what contemporary artists are showing us and commenting about our history and also offering a brighter and maybe more just future for our country. She's about to do a two-day convening at Syracuse University about monuments, which is such a controversy in this state and others. Yes. And I know she'll do a tremendous job. She's an incredible speaker, but a convener of dialogue and thought. Yeah. yeah. And I, I believe in society, we give artists a special place to think differently, to invite us to, uh, to again, um, uh, see ourselves differently, understand others, and maybe, again, have a better um, reference to the world, uh, the world in which we live in, and, and, and times past as well. So having lived with the planning, right, of the new galleries and the process and the questions, and, you know, the, once you open, and I know it's very new, so this, but once you open the new galleries, what was the thing that struck you as, I don't know, different, new, the thing that surprised you, the hmm. thing that you were perhaps proudest of? I know there's a lot of questions in there, so pick one. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so there was a sense of joy because these galleries have been closed for a number of years, right? So it was the absence of things, right? What, what do we love about Christo as an artist? He wraps something. And then it, and then we see it differently when it's unwrapped, or we we see it when it's wrapped in a different way. So it was being reconnected with artworks. Uh, the space, um, and again, very hard to convey in, in in just an image or two, is both feels more expansive and lighter. Although we closed a lot of windows, we put a new lighting system in, state of the art, and feels more intimate. We have a photography gallery that we've never had before. So we've made different kinds of spaces because we also realize people get tired, and you can't have the same you know, rhythm. Oh, more paintings and sculpture. Oh, look, another gallery of paintings and sculpture. Um, no, so so there's, there's much more variety. Uh, and then we've been mindful again. Uh, nothing is accidental in a museum. We, uh, I like to say that one of the most important decisions I have is to pick the wall color, but I only get a choice of two uh, because other people have already uh, worked that out. So everything is very intentional. So the sight lines, uh, the, the anchor pieces, all of that is, is very important. And we've also sort of said, we also bought 40, we, we brought in 42 new artworks that are now hanging in the galleries. So it's a kind of a conversation between the old and the new. So again, rediscovery or, um, or, or new conversations. So when am I coming back for your new museum <laughs> building? 2026. 2026. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's the internal process by which the Smithsonian and you have a say, particularly for a living artist, <clears throat> to reach the level of landing on the wall in the Smithsonian. That is, what's the internal side? Mm. How is it reached? Are there, you know, it's, a, it's like a jury of sorts, but you're the museum jury. Yes, yeah, I, I would imagine the process, having worked in a number of museums, is, is, is essentially the same. So you have your curatorial team. I have 13 curators. Uh, they have areas of specialty, but sometimes they are in agreement. We really have to buy this artwork. You know, we really have to get this artist. Then they come and outnumber the director, come into my office, and they make their case. And um, generally, I, you know, I'm, I have to be careful about what my own personal taste is with what the case they're making and why it's important. I ask them, what does this new artwork sit in conversation with something else, right? What new story, what new avenue does it open for us? And then I also say, how soon can we get it up on the walls, right? It's not fun to buy things or get gifts and not be able to share them as well. Uh, so I think the artists have to be of a certain stature. Uh, again, they're going to galleries around um, the country, mostly New York, of course, being a hotbed for art galleries. And then, of course, they're seeing what other museums are doing and, and are interested in. And then sometimes one artist may recommend another artist. And that's a, a fruitful path too. And also it's collectors. 
Somebody says, I've got this great work. We'd love to give it to you. And then you have to sort of say, does it make sense for us? Because we're also in the forever business. If you give it to us, the national collection, it's really not going anywhere. No. Oh, way in the back. Yes, actually, uh, if you happen to be talking to a cabinet secretary or somebody, one of the hidden benefits of the job is they actually get to furnish their offices, which are generally old and, and quite grand. And so we, we have a book of sorts. And so not surprisingly, somebody say, I'm from, I want uh, a landscape from Tennessee. I'm from Tennessee. Okay, you know, what, what, do we, what do we have in there? If not a Tennessee landscape, a Tennessee artist or whatnot. Now, um, so that we have a bit of a list of what's available. Uh, sometimes people will come with us and say, you know, I'm looking for this artist or, or again, this kind of a theme. Uh, it has to be in good condition that I can send it out. So mostly paintings because other works on paper and photographs and such, I have to rotate and it's hard to be doing this back and forth. Uh, I have to make sure the frame is in good condition as well too. Um, I don't like things over fireplaces. There are working fireplaces, believe it or not, at the US Capitol and such. Uh, Art has a political agenda. It was not an accident that the Obamas picked an African-American woman from DC to hang in the White House, right? So it has a, it has a message of sorts. Uh, think about which presidents like to have other presidential portraits, right? Um, you know, who they align themselves with. The National Portrait Gallery also sends out um, a lot of portraits as well too. So uh, they're informed that this is an opportunity. Sometimes there'll be a curator associated with with the building, the Capitol or the White House. Uh, the Supreme Court too, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just between us, had the best taste of um, her fellow <laughs> uh, uh, justices. And she had a Joseph Albers homage to the square, which we barred once. And when I saw her again, she says, don't take that from me again. <laughs> so uh, so yes, we, um, we lend. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a conversation too. Follow up to that. Great question by back there. But yeah. I was curious. Uh, the main installation of the White House is almost like a hamster wheel. What you're describing about you know personal offices and people moving in and out. That what's the process and who's involved with the main installation of is it is it each administration that did change. Changes yes, yes. So there is a, there is a White House historical collection of both furniture and paintings. Uh, it is not, doesn't have great representation by women artists or people of color, as you might imagine. <clears throat> uh, also, again, we have many more Native American artists working today, you know, in a, a, you know, a, a different scales and things like that. So, so not a lot of his, these historic residences are as welcoming to contemporary art as maybe they are to 19th century gold frame um, uh, um, paintings too. Uh, so it, it is a conversation with, between what they want and the advisor. I can tell you, uh, um, uh, Karen Pence spent a lot of time, the f uh, former vice president's wife, spent a lot of time in our storage area <laughs> looking at things that might be important for them. Because it's also, we do their pres personal residences, yeah, too. I was wondering how much you can push the envelope with that, you know. It's like you get very contemporary art, you know. Uh, sometimes people will um, have relationships with artists and, and borrow things as well, too. So uh, there's also an art and embassies program. So we don't um, provide art for embassies around the world. That's a pretty tall order. And they also commission things for embassies for public spaces. So uh, and art is a diplomatic tool. I got a call once from the White House saying, oh, we're having an event at Camp David. We'd like to have some patriotic pictures there. I'm like, Camp David with the cabins and the security <laughs> and the, oh. So there sometimes will be last minute requests as well too. But isn't it nice to think that they're thinking about art? Um, you know, in historic places too. Again, has, has meaning. You've been such a lovely audience. Thank you so much for your many questions and your, and your interest in supporting this. <laughs>